about my PhD research, which is ongoing. I'm currently about 18 months in. So, the first thing to do about my PhD is it's not actually in archaeology. It's in human geography, which has a number of connotations the way we consider what heritage is. It means they're very much looking at archaeology as a modern discipline now, rather than as a direct study of the past. But that being said, I am from an archaeological background. I had one of the PBA community archaeology training placements in Suffolk. I was a commercial archaeologist before that as well, and after it. So a lot of what I'm going to say is going to sound like I'm stating the obvious, because I've very much gone back to basics in my research, the very basics of what people get out of community archaeology. So stay with me. I'm hoping I'm going to offer a fresh perspective on what people get out of engagement in Wales. So this is my PhD question at the moment. What does it mean to people to engage with Welsh archaeological heritage? And I'm aware it's the vaguest question ever. <laughs> and it's deliberately very vague. Because as soon as you start to unpack it, you run into all sorts of trouble. For example, like, what is heritage? There are reams of textbooks on that subject. What's community archaeology? Do we even know? What's a community? What's Welsh identity? You can go further and further and further with this. So at the moment, this is the vague research area. Just what does it mean? And these are the three sites where I've so far done ethnography. So what I've done is I've gone to these digs. They're very much um, professionally-led digs rather than community-led digs. So I've gone along and I've just done ethnography there, so participant <coughs> observation. At, uh, so Kaya Heritage Project is like an Iron Age hill fort, but also with a lot of Neolithic and sort of later Roman and Dark Age stuff, where I was a supervisor as well. The other two, I was a volunteer got the Regency Regeneration Project at the National Botanic Garden of Wales and a field watching uh, walking product project on the Gow with Grunt <coughs> Organ Archaeological Trust. So I've gone along to these three sites over many, many days and just observed what people are doing, chatted to them as they're working, just to see what people are getting out of it. And the number one statement of the obvious here, people like to touch things. <coughs> it's, you can't get more obvious than that. We all know it's true, but it needs reiterating because People don't say it. There's something to holding archaeology in your hands, especially when you're not used to it, that has resonance that other heritage mediums don't have. So we've all heard things like this. To be one of the first people to hold this piece of pottery in this example for hundreds of years is really special. It makes me feel connected to the past and to my ancestors. I've only seen stuff like this in museums, so it's really nice to be able to touch it. And it feels naughty to touch it. And it's really cool. And it is really cool. <laughs> it's very true. <coughs> But the question I started considering is, is, why do people like to touch heritage objects, and does it actually matter what it is? And the answer seems to be, not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily matter what it is. So this, this big stone, is the big stone of Kyra. And what it is, it's literally a stone in a ditch. That's, it's a Neolithic ditch, and it had a big stone in it. And I've never seen a bunch of people so excited about stone in all of my life. I, I grew to hate the stone a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, there's nothing special to report about this stone. As you can see, it's sticking out the section. So it was a presence on site for about a week and a half. And during the week and a half, the excitement over the big stone and when it was going to be removed grew. It got higher and higher and higher. And I, I, I at the time, was running a, a Dark Age midden in my trench, which I thought was quite cool. No. Everyone was really into the big stone. People were more excited about the big stone than Neolithic polished stone axes that were coming out in other trenches. That, the stone was the talking point. I, when I asked someone, you know, you know, it's just a stone, why do you like it? That's the response I got. <laughs> yeah, but like, it's a really big stone. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and you can see here that people gathered from other trenches to watch the stone be removed. So only one of those people, Aaron in front, is actually from that trench. Everyone else had come over to see the big stone be removed. And I, yeah, I, I have no idea why. It was very, very strange. But uh, yeah, what seems to have happened is that I heard the word monolith bandied around quite a bit and people talking about Stonehenge. So what seems to have happened is that people understood big stones in the Neolithic context. That made sense to them. So in people's mind, in the narrative of the site, big stones in the Neolithic, monolith, Stonehenge, it flowed. So the fact that this was just a stone in the ditch was superseded by the story that people started creating that grew up around the stone. <coughs> and as an interesting aside, you'll note that all the men are in the trench 
<laughs> dig it out. I see the lady standing at the back, <laughs> passively watching. It's quite interesting. I didn't notice that until I took, uh, looked at the photos. But yeah, all the big men got in. They were taking out the stone. And this is the uh, literally posing them. <laughs> like they've killed a lion in Africa. <laughs> this, that was the excitement of the stone. Yeah, I don't know what was going on with that stone. I've never had so much hatred for a stone. <laughs> but yeah, the next point is that archaeology is fun, and it should be fun. And people like to find things. We all know that it doesn't matter who on the site actually finds anything, but we all like to be the one that finds it. We all do, it's true. It's almost a childlike sense of discovery and wonder. Oh, look, look what I've found. But as an example, at the National Botanic Gardens, a lady found, there was a real dearth of finds at the Botanic Gardens, hardly anything. And this lady found a row of 19th century bricks and she was delighted. Like she said, yeah, it couldn't be more excited if I found a chest of gold doubloons. And she told me that about 20 times. <laughs> she was thrilled. But people also like getting dirty and mucky and muddy. Again, this is a quote from the same lady as found the bricks. When I was little, I always got told off for coming home with mud on my dress, but now I can get as messy and muddy as I like. People love it. But it's not all fun. It's hard work too. We've all seen the shock when people come onto site and you give them a mattock when they're expecting a brush and they're horrified. <laughs> and they very often disappear at first, at first break, they're just gone. And those people are really hard to talk to, by the way. They're always gone before I can get hold of them. But for the people who stay, hard work is part of the is part of the enjoyment they don't enjoy it despite the hard work they enjoy it because of the hard work so it's very much part of getting a sort of sense of identity and belonging both to the group as a, an identity as an archaeologist we've all have been proud of getting our first callus look at my tan lines are so much better than yours we've all done it so it's very much the hard work and the physical labor is very much part of creating your identity on site and this, this photo here, this is on the National Botanic Gardens. So this photo doesn't do, do it justice. It was tipping down when this photo was taken. It was disgusting. And these <coughs> ladies are removing dirty, black sludge at the bottom of this well. It was grim. They, neither, this lady, Sham, didn't even have proper shoes on. It was all going in her shoes. The only find in there were those pants. Some men's pants. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the, botanic, in the botanic gardens, mind boggles. <laughs> and they were cursing and swearing and saying they hated the site director. But then when we finally got rained off at the end of the day, they were like, oh, see you tomorrow. And they both, they both came back again and again and again. And the suffering was very much part of the enjoyment. <laughs> so, who's in charge? As I said at the beginning, one of my sites at Kaya, I always ran the trench, I was a supervisor. The other two, I was just a regular volunteer. But I had really, really different experiences. This wasn't something I was expecting. It quite surprised me. So I was quite averse about my archaeological experience at all the sites, probably more than I should have been. I found it very hard to get back to being just a volunteer, and I'm used to being a supervisor. So I talked about it more than I probably should have. So the only difference was my official capacity on site. And yet when I wasn't a supervisor, when I was just a volunteer, it really restricted my movement to where I could go on site. I didn't feel able to leave my trench. Even when I knew exactly what to do, I didn't feel I could do it without asking someone first. So it really, it disempowered me massively just to be a volunteer, even though there was no other difference and everyone knew. So that, I thought that was interesting. But it also had like resonance for what we consider to be real and important on site. Because who decides what's worth investigating, what stuff is? And it's we do. The supervisors do. Of course we do. So when I was a volunteer, everyone knew my experience, you know, they knew. So they'd find something, they'd come over and they'd ask me and they'd say, oh, I found this, what is it? And 99% times a stone. And you're like, you, and I tell them, oh, I think it's a piece of pottery. And it didn't matter what I said to them, they would then go ask somebody in charge. My, my opinion wasn't good enough. They'd ask me first, and then they'd go and ask somebody else. Somebody, an official grown-up, as it were. Whereas at Cairo, when I was a supervisor, I decided everything. So this piece of Roman plastic, my, my group came over to me, they clutched in their hands, something I couldn't see yet. And they were like really worried faces, and they were like, we found this and we don't know what to do. And I was like, well, what is it, you know? It's a piece of plastic. And what it was is a piece of boot tread. You know, it's gone all compacted and shiny. It's just a piece of tread. They're like, it's plastic, what, should we throw it away? Because they thought they'd broken the archaeology, it, couldn't, it shouldn't be there. So they wanted to throw it into the hedge, so they didn't ruin the story. And I wish I'd had the presence of mind to be like, 
yeah, throw it away just to see what they would have done because I think they would have done it. <laughs> so it's very, very interesting. We very much, we very much in charge. And the other thing is trench near Cairo, which is my trench, was very much considered at Cairo to be only Roman. It was, you know, because a lot of the other, every other trench I think was Neolithic apart from my trench. So everyone was saying to me, oh, your trench is, I got commiserated. You know, we had bags and bags and bags of bags of fine coming out. We had all midden in there, loads of stuff. And yet everyone was much more into the Neolithic story because that's what the dig director was into. Like my trench had a dark age midden in it and I'm, a prehistorian by background, but even I know the Dark Age reuse of a Iron Age site is significant, really significant, but nobody cared on site. Nobody cared at all. I mean, the dig director obviously did care. He's got, you know, the report will reflect it, but on site, the stories that people were telling, which trench was only Roman, we were dismissed, despite being the biggest and having the most stuff. We were, which I thought was interesting. So, why are you interested in heritage? Now, this is something I've been asking volunteers on site. Why are you here? Why do you enjoy it? What do you get out of it? And I've been met with absolute blank stares. People don't know how to answer that question at all. I've been avoided, like, <laughs> like I've asked them something really difficult. But ultimately, the answer is almost always history. People, yeah, you've all heard this. I've always want, been interested in history. I always wanted to be an archaeologist when I was younger. That's what people always say when I ask them. But, as I, I think I've shown, once people are on the site, the, the actions aren't necessarily reflecting what people are saying. So each site very much develops its own sense of community. It develops its own stories, its own narratives. The value attached to the heritage of each site is completely relative. Completely relative. You know, it is. Despite what we might want, <laughs> people that have their own, their own views of it. So, you know, the idea of playing, of working hard, of creating that sense of belonging and identity to the sites and to the community are very much played out through people's actions rather than what they're saying. So I'm going to ask two questions to finish, as you can see here. First is, if people, what people are saying isn't reflecting their actions, how do we measure success in community archaeology? It actually becomes very, very difficult. And how can we reflect these values, the values of playing, of finding, of discovering, of belonging, in our values as heritage professionals? Thank you.